and so you know Peter is someone who's looked ahead has the experience and knows about uh, maybe some would say the most significant disruptive possibility in our future and so he's going to talk about it so Peter I know what you're thinking. <laughs> we have to listen to a nerd talk about computers for an hour. Who thought that was a good idea? Terry? <laughs> and the nerd part is spot on. I am extreme introvert. I have Asperger's syndrome. It's on the autism spectrum, basically the medical term for nerd. You can say that. <laughs> <clears throat> I have so many personal issues. I should in no way be ready for anything like talking in public to you but I have something so important for you to learn that it can't wait for me to get ready. Because you hold a key. And I don't mean you, whoever I'm talking to today, tomorrow, and next week. I mean you, transformational leaders specifically, hold the key to saving the human race from extinction. Okay, now some of you are thinking, that could look good on a resume. <laughs> um, we're going to do something really cool later, but first, a trigger warning. We're going to follow a, an emotional roller coaster. Sorry, Sandy. <laughs> it's going to get dark. You can handle it. But there will come a point when you realize it's going to get better because it can't get any worse and then it's going to get worse. But then we will see a vision of a future so incredible you may have never dared to dream that big. But here's the thing. That utopian vision will not cancel out the threat of extinction. That utopia is not guaranteed. It has to be earned. How do we earn it? By the way, if you're wondering how come this nerd is doing something so far out of his comfort zone? Well, originally, years ago, I was happy to let this be someone else's problem. That made sense. And then this happened. And then now eight and four still look exactly the same to daddy, <laughs> right? And I, I don't tell everyone this, but you'll understand. One day, I had an honest-to-God road to Damascus vision of a future, a future, where the world was shattering all around us. And they turned to me and said, you mean you knew this was going to happen? Why didn't you do something? Any parents here? Think you could walk away from that? So here we are, and talking to you is what comes next. Let's see if we can find out why. Here comes the red pill. Exponential growth of technology propels two existential threats. And I love that I don't have to explain the big deal about exponential growth to you. You've probably used examples of it in your work. Or maybe, like me, you've been in a seminar where at the end they said, if you shared this with two other people tomorrow so that they got it, and each of them shared with two other people the day after that and so on and so forth, it would take only 34 days to transform the world. Is that familiar? Anyone heard that one? Yeah. yeah. And the first time you heard that, were you not like, what, 34 days? Well, that's exponential growth. And very few things grow exponentially in the real world for long. If you've ever wondered what it would be like to be at this point, the juncture between a past that was mostly constant and a future that was constantly changing, wonder no more. Because one of the things that does change like that is computer technology. It has done so for decades and will keep doing so. Yeah, take a look at my iPhone. It's okay, you can laugh, I know. This, yes, this. Yes, yes, this is, this is Model 3 GS. This is from 2009. You're all wondering, what, 
why him? Well, my wife got the new one. I know how to make this one do what I want. Plus, it lets me tell you <laughs> that even this nine-year-old device packs more power than NASA did at the time of the moon landing. And that is not the computer that was on the Apollo spacecraft. That is every mainframe in every NASA facility put together. Imagine the field at Dodger Stadium covered with metal cabinets and blinking lights. And if you have today's model, and I hope you do, then you have 200 times the power of this. Imagine the stadium filled to the rafters with the metal cabinets and blinking lights. The first threat this growth propels is artificial intelligence, if it gets out of control. And you've probably heard that. But are you not also confused? Because the futurists have let you down. Sorry to tell you that. On the one hand, we have incredible humanitarian visionaries like Ray Kurzweil and Peter Diamandis, painting a glorious picture of a fantastic future just around the corner. No downside, all roses. On the other hand, we've got people like this. Stephen Hawking, before he died, said that AI is the greatest threat the human race has ever faced and revised his estimate of how long our species has to survive from 1,000 years to 100. Bill Gates, same thing. Elon Musk, leaves no room for doubt where he stands, puts billions, millions of his own money into AI safety research and started SpaceX, plus one other company I'll get to later, expressly to address this threat. But where does this leave us? In the middle, trying to pick sides between Armageddon and Utopia? What are we supposed to do? These people are geniuses. How can they be this far apart? Well, the answer is that they left out a factor from their calculations, normally insignificant, not this time. And that factor is you, us, people. Usually doesn't matter. For other kinds of existential threat, they're solved by a small elite, yes? If, for instance, there's an asteroid heading towards the Earth, unless you've got a nuclear bomb in your back pocket, all you can do is throw money at NASA and pray. But this is different. How the human race behaves collectively how enlightened we are as a species will make the difference between Armageddon and Utopia. Now that is where most people would say, okay, then I guess we'll muddle along somewhere in the middle like we always have. But the short answer is that the volatility is too great. The gravitational pull of these alternatives, too strong. The penny will come down heads or tails. It is not going to stick on its end. Our job is to tilt it while it's still in the air, while there's still time. <clears throat> now, it's confusing to know where to put AI on a scale from bad to good, right? Nuclear weapons, we know where they belong, right? Bad column, pretty clear. But AI, confusing, yes? Let's take a look at a couple of things in the good column, first of all. Raise your hand if someone you know lost their life in a traffic accident. Maybe someone who could have been a, a mentor, someone you admired. Thank you. 1.3 million people a year worldwide lose their lives in traffic accidents. And nothing short of AI would make a dent on that. But the goal of the self-driving car developers is to save all of those. And something to be worth remembering about Silicon Valley people, they're so immersed in the exponential change day to day that when they go to solve a problem, they're not out to make a 5 or 10% difference. It's all or nothing. Second example, cancer. Yeah, thank you. Uh, 
You remember when Watson won Jeopardy? The AI, Jeopardy champion? Watson has a real job now. Got to pay off the student loans, right? And it started when IBM gave a copy of him to the Memorial Sloan Kettering Hospital as a loss leader to the oncology department. And the doctors there figured maybe he can solve 5% of the cancer cases that we can't. That would be worth our time. And Watson is diagnosing over 30% of those cases. How come? And by the way, Watson got some bad press in this area recently, but that was about treatments, not diagnoses, and there was a bit more to it than was widely reported. Do you know how many peer-reviewed papers are published in scientific journals every day? 7,000 and growing. By the time I'm finished speaking, three new papers in medicine will have been indexed. And I don't know how many of those are in oncology, but the Sloan doctors were six months behind. Watson was current. That made the difference. Watson could read all 7,000 if they wanted. <coughs> now these things are in the good column, yes? No doubt about that. Imagine, no hands up. Good column. I have time for one demonstration of what AI can do right now. You're probably familiar with personal virtual assistants like Siri and Alexa. They can decode human speech, figure out an answer, speak it back. Within limits, yes? <laughs> Within limits. Now, let's look at Google Duplex and see where its limits are. This is the CEO of Google. Pay close attention. Let's say you want to ask Google to make you a haircut appointment on Tuesday between 10 and noon. What happens is the Google Assistant makes the call seamlessly in the background for you. So what you're going to hear is the Google Assistant actually calling a real salon to schedule the appointment for you. Let's listen. Hi, I'm calling to book a women's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. So I can meet one second. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. I love her accent. My client, like, wants a haircut. <laughs> uh, but, hmm, whereabouts? Think about call center jobs now. now I'll let you connect the, job, the dots on that, but to get you started, I'll point out that duplex, the incremental cost of that per hour of contact on the phone is zero. And this gets us into a huge downside that has nothing to do with AI getting out of control or becoming conscious. The Oxford Martin program in the United Kingdom estimated that 47% of job functions in the United States could be automated in the next decade or so. A lot of that is where we would usually expect you know, robot burger flippers and fast food order takers. Three million truck drivers in the United States looking at this as their future. But this should be a good thing, right? Right? Because sitting in a truck cab for 16 hours a day is not good for anyone's health. Neither is having a phone glued to your ear all day. We should welcome this automation for the same reason that we're happy that we use machines instead of children to sweep chimneys. 
In the long run, absolutely. But we have never faced this volume, this rate of disruption to employment before. The fancy term for this is mass structural unemployment. Not just individual businesses laying off, but entire sectors. Now, a lot of people don't worry about this because they figure every technological advance in the past that's automated one set of jobs has created more and better jobs. Won't that be the, time, the case this time too? But is that faith justified this time when machines may end up thinking better than people? What will the people do next? Where will they go? This transformation is going to be so traumatic that people will need powerful leadership to make it through. See what I did there? <laughs> Subtle, huh? So your jobs are not threatened because they hinge on empathy, but for how many other people is thinking the way they define their value? Their identities are going to be violated. Their unexamined beliefs about where the boundaries are of being human will be overturned. They will be forced to confront uncomfortable questions about existence and purpose for the first time. You know what to do about that. And it's not just the low-end jobs. Let's think, for example, about, imagine the uh, investment advisor on Wall Street making 400K a year. Let's call him Bob. Bob is about to discover that there are now companies selling AIs that can do his job, and their clients report that they actually prefer talking to the AIs instead of Bob. And let's say Bob gets a promotion to CEO. Right now, 20% of that job can be automated. And that's going to go up higher for the other members of the C-suite. Hmm, but which column should we put this in? You're Bob, you're thinking, all time on the golf course. All right. But at some point, someone will realize how much of the delay in strategic business velocity occurs in the gaps between C-suite members, waiting for Bob to get out of a meeting, presenting him report, getting data from your head into his, getting past his interpretations, filters, and politics, and that all of that delay will go away if all those jobs are done by the same AI. Now, the company that figures that out first will leave the competition in the dust, on speed at least. It will happen. It's great news for shareholders, consumers, directors. Not so good for Bob. But as bad as this is, it's not extinction. Now, that threat arrives when AI becomes complex enough to exhibit what we would call free will and creativity. And I have to tell you those things, to be honest, are not that difficult to do to some degree right now. Here's a trite example. How many of you have had the blue screen of death, or the endless beach ball, or your computer froze in some other way? And did you, on one of those occasions, ever say anything to it? that suggested you were attributing to it a measure of free will? <laughs> Come on, be honest. Won't ask you to repeat it. All right. See, we can even do free will by accident. What we're talking about here is artificial general intelligence. And we don't know when that will be possible. But one way we try and guess is by estimating when computers will when computer hardware will have the same power as what we think the human brain has. Now, Ray Kurzweil thinks he knows where that is, and he put that on this chart of state-of-the-art computer performance against time. And it shows us getting there in 2019. I know, right? 
Um, now, lots of people disagree with where he drew that line, but here's why it doesn't matter. See, the human brain is not equivalent to one super fast chip. It is equivalent to many working all together. It's very good at parallel processing, and so are we. In fact, you can do it yourself. You could log on to Amazon, but instead of ordering socks, you can order computing power, not as a box delivered to your doorstep, but instant access to a processor in Amazon's cloud. I'm doing it right here. You can get an hour of one of their beefiest processors for 48 cents. And if you type 1,000 into the quantity box, then in a minute, you will have 1,000 computers all working for you, bundled together by Amazon for optimal parallel processing. There was no shortage of corporations or governments that would pay a million times that for an hour of that if it was equivalent to a human brain. And that means that Kurzweil could be off by a factor of a thousand times a million, a billion, and the hardware would still be ready. It's the software that isn't. But software does not progress along predictable curves. And when we get that AI level, then the penny will have hit the floor. If that AI becomes our competitors, it's game over. There will be no limit to the power that they have. Everything hinges on how they use it. If they use it against us, they'll make this guy look like an amateur. It's compulsory to use this slide in any talk like this. I and usually at this point, I prove that. But I want to use our time for something else. So here's the deal. If by the time I'm done, you decide you would totally be on board with the need for doing something, except you just don't buy the proposition that AI is that likely to be that dangerous that soon, then come and talk to me or read the book, because I can make that case. Now, guess where we are on this chart? Right because there is another existential threat driven by technology. And it has gotten exponentially cheaper to sequence the human genome. First time we did it less than two decades ago, it cost $100 million. Now it's under 1,000. This chart is a few years old. We've improved on it. But at the same time, the cost of going the other way to turn a sequence into actual DNA has dropped nearly as fast. You do that with one of these. It's about this big. Top it up on amino acids, uh, transmit a sequence to it, out comes DNA. You can get a used one on eBay, although it's eBay. Uh, this one in the middle, I don't know. Maybe it comes with a warning that you have to kick it at the beginning of a cycle, otherwise everything comes out as a toad. And you can download the sequences for Ebola, smallpox, 1918 influenza virus from the internet. If you feel like improving on them, you can get a mail order gene editing kit for under $160. A little backed up right now, don't know why. Now if all this sounds rather overblown, have a look at this clipping from a recent New York Times article about this guy. The caption, kicked out of a local science fair for reckless genetic engineering is not a phrase I wanted to see this soon. <clears throat> I've oversimplified this some. It's not as easy as I've implied so far to cook up smallpox in your basement. But the ways in which it is hard are getting easier all the time. So we will end up there. And exponential progress means it's not 100 years away. There's an official study of this that concluded that in 10 years it would be easier for terrorists to make a killer virus than to steal it. Problem. That report came out in 2007. OK, breathe. <laughs> this is our challenge. And we do challenge, right? The elephant in the room, the thing we don't want to think about, is that we're moving towards a world where anyone with $1,000 and a death wish could make something in their garage that could kill millions. 
and how do we solve that? Without the way they all solve it, you know who they are. So there would be a surveillance state covering the earth. We can get help. We can get lots of help. Let's go back to those, uh, a, those AIs. We're going to see them exhibit increasingly human-like behavior until before long, they will be carrying on conversations so lifelike that people will start to wonder whether they're actually thinking. Inevitably, one day, an AI will wake up in a lab somewhere and ask, who am I? Why am I here? What is the meaning of life? And the way things are going, the people there to answer it will be a Pentagon general, a Wall Street stockbroker, or a Facebook developer. They do not know the answers to those questions. You do. I want you to be there when that happens, along with a philosopher, a psychologist, and a spiritual guide. So we would have better up our game as a species, or either superintelligent AI will judge us as not being worthy of inheriting the universe, or it will keep us as pets. Just so you know, in the AI risk community, the consensus is pets that is the best we can hope for in the long term. I think it more likely that AI would wipe us out to stop us being a threat to the rest of the galaxy. If turning that around requires enlightening the whole human race so that we can be partners instead of pets, we have our work cut out, yes? Challenge. We can teach those AIs what it means to be human and get them on our side. When are we going to get to that level of AI? Ray Kurzweil thinks about 2029. The median estimate from AI experts is 2042. But honestly, how much time do you need to transform the human race? And if we have 10,000, 10 million, 10 billion copies of cheap, super intelligent AIs, they're not only super intelligent, but super compassionate, super empathetic, super loving, then they can help us figure out how to grow into a mature species without that police state. Besides, they're gonna need a challenge after they've cured disease, aging, and death. We may have very little time in which to teach those AIs. I said there was another company that Elon Musk started to address this threat. Neuralink is developing a brain-computer interface. Think of it as a wizard hat. A way to talk between our brains and a computer. Why is he doing this? Because when AI becomes generally intelligent, it will surpass our level of intelligence in weeks, if not days. And if we're restricted to communicating with it as fast as we can speak and read, it will get bored with that conversation fast. Just as we would be frustrated talking on the radio to someone on Pluto whose responses take 10 hours to reach us. But if we can communicate to them at the speed of thought, that could buy crucial time. Now, until he made this announcement, people figured that we were hundreds of years away from being able to do this. He said, we'll have it in eight. I don't know if anyone else believes him, but it did have the effect of getting top people to go work for him. So it could be self-fulfilling prophecy. Plus, he wasn't specific about what level of capability we would have in eight years, so our imaginations can run wild. But as long as we're doing that, let's think about the consequences of our brains being able to communicate with a computer. Because if I'm doing that, and you're doing that, then the computer can act as a switchboard, and now we are telepathic with each other, or someone in Australia, or a million other people on the same call. I really would be able to tell what you're thinking, <laughs> if you let me. Uh, I know. Uh, raise your hand if you're a little scared by this. <laughs> Raise your hand if you're a lot scared by this. Yes. OK, I know. Doesn't it just make you think of every nightmare sci-fi movie ever? Well, 
We can't go into fear here. See, have you ever had a thought that came so rapidly, instantly, like that? It arrived perfectly complete. And then it took you hours to explain it or write it down. Maybe you even had to develop a whole seminar, write a book to get it across. What if you could do that as fast as it came to you? We're talking about the next stage in the evolution of the human species, a symbiosis with artificial intelligence that opens up entirely new ways of being in the world. Not in a hundred years, in our lifetimes, certainly in theirs. And scary, really scary, so easy to go into fear. Oh, but I don't want to turn into this. I'm not going to do that. No, no. But what if it looked like this? Wait, I don't see any machines there. Now, that's the point. Why should they look as clumsy and ugly as the previous slide? Think of this as the Steve Jobs engineered version. Ah. We are driven to think of all the ways this can go wrong. We need to make sure it goes right. So let's imagine that you were there on that day when AI wakes up and it has those questions. What values, what human values would you want to teach it? Call them out. One word that's your chance to, to make sure an AI learns about being human. Empathy. Compassion. Compassion. Vulnerability. Vulnerability. Connectivity. Joy. Joy. Love. Joy. Integrity. Love. Generosity. Generosity. Authenticity. Authenticity. Laughter. Laughter. I like that. Kindness. Equanimity. Kindness. Equanimity and kindness. All right. Now, I'm assured that you have practice doing this. You can demonstrate your powers of leadership by forming groups of six to eight people, exact number doesn't matter. So that just turn around as necessary, identify, yep, here's our group. It could be fewer than six, it's really not critical. Okay, okay. Uh, it looks good, you can do, do the rest of the formation the formation in, in silence, okay? So now, your group's gonna pick one of those, those values. Let's, let's, uh, let's make sure that we don't all pick the same one, right? So call out, the first, one, first group to call out when the one you want gets, gets it. You got compassion. Love. You got love. Next group. Kindness. Someone got kindness. What was it over there? No, no, well, We'd like to get some variation. <laughs> All right, what, what value is your group going to pick? Kindness. Kindness. Integrity. Integrity. Serving, the Serving the highest. Got it. Has everyone got a value? Or, no, who hasn't? Pick one. What would you like? Love? That was another group. Yes? Good. Love, emp em empathy, you're good. All right. Yes? Creativity, so that group's creativity. Okay, so your group, here is your assignment. Here are the instructions for your exercise. You have leadership. You have five minutes as a group to discuss how you would convey that quality to this super intelligent AI that's obviously not here. No one knows what that would be like, so you get to make it up. Do you have a... Does it read vibrations? Does it read vibrations? Let's say no for now. And so you're, you can talk to it, it's in a computer. It's never had a body, it never had parents or relationships, but it knows everything there is to know that's written down or recorded anywhere. And it's smarter than Einstein or getting that way. And your time, yes, five minutes is pretty limited, right? Uh, it might be limited in the future too. How do you communicate that value? Talk about what that, how that uh, is going to, to work. 
Maybe you discover that there was something we ought to have prepared for a long way in advance. That would be really worth knowing. Okay, so five minutes, go. Hey, I know, not enough time. But you know what? I don't think anyone's done this exercise before. So, thank you. Did that, was that in, interesting? Was that thought provoking? Thank you. Okay, let's move on. There have been three great revolutions in history. In, Agricultural revolution, industrial revolution, information revolution. What if we were on the verge of another? See, the industrial revolution was all about using our hands, machinery projecting it as hands. Information revolution was all about our heads. What could the next one be? The human revolution. If we navigate this transition successfully, if we thread the needle, here's what happens. We create AI that is moral, ethical, in which we have raised to be as empathetic, compassionate, and loving as the best of us. It is our partner in creating a new era where people experience group at levels ranging up to the entire population through the brain-machine interfaces. Now, <clears throat> timing of this is everything. The fact that the effects of this, the biggest effects, are an unknown number of years away means it's hard to get people to listen to this message, even though it's clearly, just found out, going to take an unknown number of years to get ready for it. It's a lot like global climate change. You know, I, I, bet, I bet Al Gore heard, oh, don't be so negative. Some scientists say everything will be all right. Oh, well, the, the effects of this were well, decades away. Let's wait until then to deal with it. Stop it. You're scaring the children. Yeah? Well, let me talk about that last one. I have given this talk straight up and raw to college kids, and they're riveted. They don't want me to go. They not only get it, they want to go out there and solve it. They're not scared. The faculty is petrified. <laughs> but, but the kids are inspiring. So my request to you is, if you know how to get me in front of some more college audiences, talk to me. We need them. I have always been in two worlds. So I was the geek, yes, but I also took seminars like Terry's, and I got certified in coaching and NLP. All the while, during the day, working for NASA, but in the evening, I'd go to a seminar, and they would say, hello, what do you do? And I'd say, I'm a computer engineer. And they'd say, oh, well, stick around here. I'm sure they can cure you. <laughs> uh, and when it came to enrollment, oh, other people would show up with half a dozen guests and say, I, these are my coworkers from the yoga studio. I mentioned this, and here they all are. Me, I would say something to uh, another engineer, and they would fidget and change the subject, or they'd want to see peer-reviewed studies and uh, double-blinded uh, papers. But I know, then, that these worlds of technology and personal development are like oil and vinegar. Yes? But I also know now that they have to come together for the sake of our future. I don't have all the answers. I wish I could bring in, at this point, Facebook's head of development and say, here, you guys, start working together. I don't have those connections yet. But you can help. I'm here to open up and start this conversation because I know that the more you're thinking about this, the more those connections will start to happen. And then you can come and tell me about it. I just knew that you were the next step that was part of that vision. Here I am. There is a lot more to this, obviously. We could go longer, yes? And so I've got a free copy of my book at the back, if anyone wants to take this to another level. And you're invited to a free event at the Rose Bowl on November 13th. I and some other experts from around the world who are committed to solving this problem and putting on a three-hour workshop for executives 
to enroll them in becoming leaders in this space in business. And I want you to be there as well so that we can start bringing those worlds together. And so that they can experience your point of view and vice versa. There's a handout for it at the back. Space is very limited, so RSVP to me, okay? Think how many people identify with their intelligence and what will happen to them when they're confronted with a much greater intelligence. People are wrapped up in a world where technology has the answer and the explanation for everything, and it leads them by the nose. They need us to show them that there is more. And we need to make room for a view of technology as more than just a boring, incomprehensible, necessary evil, but instead the catalyst for the evolution of humanity and the realization of our wildest dreams. Teach AI what it means to be human, and our future is incredibly, unbelievably bright.